Yes, good. Uh, thanks for that introduction. And I'm very happy to be here um, to talk to you about some of the things that we and some other people do. And as you can see, I've added a little bit to the title. I am going to use the example of how insects communicate acoustically to make uh, a slightly different point, which is how animals with very small brains faced with big problems to solve in this world can still solve them in fairly smart ways. Um, smart ways that do not necessarily use a lot of brain power. And that's sort of the central theme that I'm going to sort of come back to again and again. The system that I use to study acoustic communication uh, is crickets. And I hope all of you know what crickets are. They're jumping insects. Very large number of species of crickets actually communicate by producing sound. And they produce this sound by rubbing their four wings together. And the reason this produces sound is because the four wing is actually specialized. If you look at this particular vein and you look at the underside of it, you will see this row of pegs, which you can see blown up in this SEM. Uh, of the uh, pile. And there's also a little plectrum or a hardened piece at the margin, like a guitar plectrum. And the two wings look similar. So basically what happens is that when the cricket you know, rubs its two wings together, the plectrum of one side rubs against the file of the other. So every time the cricket closes its wing, plectrum of one wing rubs against the file on the underside of the other. You can think of it as a knife rubbing against a comb every time the cricket closes its wing. And that is what produces the fundamental sound. But this fundamental sound is then changed around and amplified by these two resonance structures on the wing, the harp and the mirror, largely the harp. They make the sound louder. They also change the pitch of the sound and then you get the final uh, sound that you hear. If you produce sounds, it makes sense that you should be able to hear them. And crickets can hear sounds. They have ears. But their ears are on their forelegs. That is the first pair of legs below the knee. And they have eardrums very similar to the kinds of eardrums we, we do. That is, they sense air pressure. Why do crickets sing? Simple. Typically, only adult male crickets sing. And they sing to attract females. And you can see that this was known from very long ago. This is from a very old painting in the 1700s. And here is a male cricket singing at his burrow. And here is a female who is approaching him. You can see she's a female because she has this long ovipositor. If you make a recording of the call of a cricket and you play it out in the field, you can actually attract females of that species. So basically, these acoustic signals alone are sufficient to convey the message um, to females. What makes them particularly interesting is Um, yeah. So what makes these songs particularly interesting is that each species has its own specific kind of call. And I'm going to play you the calls of these three species to make that point. So here is the first species. Second. You can hear the difference. You can hear the difference in the rhythm. And in the third one, you'll be able to hear the difference in the pitch as well, right? The pitch is different in the third one. And you can actually see that if you look at these representations. I had to do this because the calls were overlapping. If I didn't. Let me just give us a minute. Yeah. So you can see that in this one, you can see these houses 
Each of these pulses, by the way, is one wing closure. So what this tells you is the number of times the cricket actually opens and closes its wings. And you can see that these pulses are placed further apart than these. So there are differences in the rhythm parameters, how quickly they open and close. There are differences in the pitch. And both of these together contribute to making the song of each species quite unique. Okay? What purpose does this serve? Well, these three species actually share a patch of grass on the campus of the Indian Institute of Science. This is from a long time ago. And if a female actually now has to find a male based on the calls that he's putting out, there are three things that she needs to do. First of all, she has to be able to detect the signal. She has to be able to recognize the species-specific song pattern. And then she needs to be able to locate a single calling male of her species. Okay. So here's an experiment to show you. Females can locate males of their species using their songs alone. So what did we do here? We made a sound recording of the call of a species of cricket. We dug a little hole in the ground. These are field crickets. They live in the ground. And we placed a loudspeaker inside. And we played out this call. We release a female about a meter away and just follow her as she walks. And you can see that she walks, and then she will jump into this. Similarly, here's another female. They meander a bit, but they're able to find the source of this. If you now play the same animal, a call of a different species, you can see she either walks away or she walks somewhere randomly, although she actually can hear this call very well. This is exactly the same pitch, the same frequency as the call of the other species, but she ignores it. So what an experiment like this tells you is that they're perfectly capable of distinguishing between these two patterns, and they will move towards a pattern that interests them. Okay? I'm not going to focus today on the issue of how they recognize one pattern from another. I'm going to focus much more on how they actually locate these. Okay? Because this is actually a very challenging problem. Locating a sound source is always a challenging problem. And the reason for that is because of the way of the nature of sound and the way ears are structured. So sound, as you know, is pressure. And pressure is a scalar quantity. And your eardrum, which senses the sound pressure, also actually doesn't convey any information about where that sound is coming from. So it is very challenging for any animal to be able to locate a sound source. The way that most vertebrates solve this problem is by having two ears. Okay? And what they do is, if there's a sound source out to my left, then that sound source will hit my left ear a tiny, tiny bit earlier than it hits my right ear. Okay? So there's a time difference between when it hits the left and the right. Okay? If it's right out in front or behind, it will hit both the ears at the same time. So you go from zero time difference to a max time difference as you move from front to side. Similarly, um, there's also a tiny, tiny intensity difference. It's a little bit louder in this ear than it is in that if the sound is that way, that sound. So there's also a small interaural intensity difference. And most vertebrates actually compute these time differences and these intensity differences in order to pinpoint where a sound is coming from. But to do that, you need millions of neurons. Okay? Now let's look at an insect. So the song frequencies, the pitch at which these crickets sing, is 4 to 5 kilohertz, which means they have wavelengths of 7 to 8 centimeters. Okay? The cricket itself is less than a centimeter. Okay? So the entire body of the cricket is much, much less than one wavelength of the song. If, and worse, their ears are out on the legs. Okay? There's not even body between them. And a very tiny distance, which is less than half a centimeter, 
between the ears. Think of how much will a sound attenuate in intensity in less than half a centimeter? How long does it take for sound to actually travel from here to there? So the time delays that we're talking about are less than 20 microseconds, okay? Which means that if I actually have to use time difference, right? 20 microseconds is really the max time difference I'm likely to get. So I have to be able to resolve even much, much better uh, uh, time to be able to get any kind of resolution in space. Okay? So the problem is a very hard one. Vertebrates devote millions and millions of neurons in their brains to solving this problem. Okay? A cricket doesn't even have a million neurons. Okay? But a cricket can find another cricket using song alone. right? So what's the secret thing? The secret is actually the ear itself. So I told you the ears are on their forelegs. So here's the eardrum. And it's backed by an air cavity that goes through the leg. Okay? It's a trachea. As you know, insects have all these air tubes running through them. So this is a trachea that goes through the foreleg. But in crickets, this has become part of the ear. It doesn't, it doesn't serve a respiratory function. So this is the spiracle. The, the, the respiratory entry, really, on the first segment of the thorax, which has become part of the ear. So if you slice a transverse section through a cricket that hears, this is what it will look like. There's the eardrum, and then there's this trachea, and then there is the spiracle input. So this eardrum, which is set into vibration, is set into vibration not only by the sound coming from outside. Sound goes through the spiracle, through the body of the cricket, and hits it from the other end. Okay. So this is called a pressure difference ear, okay? not a simple pressure ear, because sounds coming from outside, but sounds also coming from inside the body. It's also coming from the other side of the body. So how much this vibrates in the end is going to depend upon the interference of the direct sound wave with all of these indirect sound waves. Okay? And as a result of this kind of geometry and the particular wavelength of the sound, the result is that an eardrum on the left side will actually vibrate much, much more to a sound source on the left than a sound source equidistant from it on the right, which is really what you sort of see in this diagram. So if I move a sound source in a circle around the animal, then the sound is much louder. Let's say this is the right ear on the right side. And if I move to the left, then the right ear will vibrate much, much less. So the trick is in the physics and in the geometry of the system itself. But how good is it? Nonetheless, I talked to you about one source. But in the natural environment, you've got large numbers of singing crickets of one species, of different species, and sounds get changed in various ways by the environment itself. In other words, it's a cocktail party problem. Everybody's shouting or singing at the same time, and your problem is to pick out one pattern and move towards it. The first thing one asks is, are these crickets even able to represent these patterns? So if you do an experiment where you tether a flying cricket and play two patterns to it, it can tell the difference and orient towards one, which tells you again that they're actually able to do this. You can look at the same problem neurophysiologically. So you can make a recording from a neuron in the auditory system, play it one pattern. Okay, So here is the sound pattern. And here is the firing of that one neuron, which nicely represents that pattern. If you now play two patterns together, two different patterns, of which one is very much louder, then that one neuron will preferentially represent the louder pattern. Okay? So in other words, it selectively attends to the louder of many different patterns that are present in the environment which is one way by which these animals solve the problem of having to deal with multiple patterns. They represent only the loudest patterns. And then they turn towards 
whichever is louder. Is the left louder or the right louder? So it's a sort of a simple algorithm that they use. What do crickets really listen to? So we went out into the field and we figured out in the field where are calling males. So each of these is a calling male. We figured out how far their calls transmit in the field by making measurements of the loudness. And we use this information together with an understanding of how sensitive the ears of females are to figure out how far, on average, can a male's call be heard. That's these circles, OK? And a female sitting here will hear only one male. A female sitting here will hear three males. Okay. A female sitting here will hear two males. So you can look at this. And what we figured out is, yes, there are such many situations in which they're actually listening or hearing multiple males. But this doesn't uh, matter to them in the interest of time, because I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you the four source. This is a video which should show you. We're playing outdoors from four speakers, four songs together. And the cricket is here in the middle, she's moved out here. So the question we ask is, can she find one of them? And we will see in a minute. Um, she actually goes to one of them. So she's able to locate one source among many. And if you do this over and over and over again, with a large number of crickets, you can see that 90% of the time, they are able to find one speaker, although there are four simultaneously playing. So then the question is, how are they managing to do this? And to ask this question, what we did was to run a simulation. So we have a fairly good understanding of how the ear works. Okay, of the physics of the ear and the directionality. We have some understanding of how the auditory physiology works. So I know if there are multiple signals, then you will represent the loudest one at that point. And we know that they finally compare two patterns and turn towards the louder with a certain stochasticity in the way they turn. So if you put in all of these rules by which these animals orient, and you put in what we learn about where sound sources are and how loud they are in the field. And we run this in a simulation and we ask, do these virtual females actually find sound sources? The answer is yes. So here is our real experiment where we have lots of animals that we've tested one at a time. And here is our simulation of that experiment using the rules we put in. And you can see that there's a remarkable agreement in the kinds of parts and the numbers of animals that actually find speakers. Okay. What an approach like this tells us is that at least the rules that we have learned so far are sufficient to explain this orientation towards multiple sound sources. Okay. Um, so perhaps we do know most if not all of the rules by which these animals can actually locate sound sources. Why is this interesting? Because you can then use these rules to design artificial systems or robotic systems. And this is now being done for almost two decades now using the cricket system. So you can make autonomously navigating artificial systems that can work in complex sound environments that can use these simple rules that these insects use to go in and approach a particular sound source. Okay? So that's the way in which you could actually apply uh, some of the things you learn from systems like this. More recently, they have put in um, these same kinds of rules of directionality of cricket ears into micro air vehicles, so now you, they have also been put into um, flying systems. And not the cricket system, but very similarly a parasitic fly that uses a very unique system of 
directional hearing using mechanics, okay, has also more recently been implemented into trying to improve directionality in hearing aids. Okay? What we learn from studying these really small systems that do not use computational solutions, but use mechanical solutions and small devices and small numbers of computational agents is that you can make very, very small smart structures that can actually locate things or improve the directionality of the signals that you might get from the environment. Ears, in fact, ears come in a marvelous variety of forms and I'm just showing you some from a textbook of general orthopteran ears, that's ears of crickets and grasshoppers. We've maybe studied a handful of systems, maybe three or four species, but there are lots of ears. There are lots of ears hearing lots of sounds. And if you go into a rainforest, as in the Kudremuk National Park, where you will hear at night, is large numbers of insects of large numbers of species calling together. If I just make a sound recording of this and make what's called a spectrogram, which shows you this is time on this axis and the frequencies that are present in this chorus, you can see these really nice patterns. Can you see these bands? What these bands are, this is, for example, one species. This is a second species. This is a third species. This is a fourth. This is a fifth. Many species, their signals are band limited. So particular species may call within particular frequencies and very similar to radio frequencies that you tune into. Okay? So if you call only at this frequency, and if you have a receiver that can tune into that frequency, then that helps you to cut out the noise. Right? So do insects do this? Yes, they do. So I'm going to give you one example. This is a beautiful canopy leaf catered it. And it has a very nice call, so I will play it for you. It is a very beautiful call. And stop it. If you look at the ear, so, so one thing I want to emphasize, it sounded very musical, very tonal. Okay, that's because most of its energy is concentrated only in one frequency. If you look at the ear of this animal, okay, this is the eardrum, and I'm going to show you, just for fun really, a 3D reconstruction. Today it's possible to do these micro CT scans where you can, it's like doing a CT scan uh, for yourself, but you can do it on these really small animals, and you can actually reconstruct in 3D the actual structure of the ear. And this is the ear of this animal. As you can see, it's a complicatedly folded tube. Okay? That's what this ear is. You can ask whether this ear is tuning in in some way. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to first look at the eardrum itself. So does the eardrum itself tune in in some way? And the way you do that is quite simple. You immobilize an animal and you play sounds to it. And it's possible using laser vibrometry to actually measure these eardrum vibrations. And you play different frequencies of sound, and you measure the eardrum vibrations. So here are frequencies of sound, and here are the eardrum vibrations. You can see from the form of this curve that the vibrations at frequencies lower than about 4 kilohertz are much higher than at frequencies higher than that. In other words, this ear acts as a low-pass filter. It's letting through much more of the lower frequencies, cutting out the higher frequencies. Let's look at the environment in which this animal lives. Here is its frequency, just around 3. Most of the noise in the forest <coughs> is actually above it. So by listening through this ear, you're actually 
able to cut out a lot of the high frequency noise. And what's remarkable about this is this is not being done by neural processing. Okay? This is right at the ear itself, and we don't understand how it does. Um, you get all kinds of filters when you look at different ears across the insects. Uh, this is another cricket in which you can see, again, displacement of the eardrum tuned to a particular frequency, which is the frequency of its call. But what do you do if your frequency changes with temperature? This happens in a very special group of crickets, the tree crickets. They're one of the few groups in which the pitch actually changes with temperature. So beginning of the night at 24 degrees as now, it will call at a higher, uh, the animal will call at a higher um, frequency. End of the night at 16 degrees, it's gone down almost by a kilohertz. Okay? So the same cricket will have a higher pitch when it's warm and a lower pitch. This makes life quite complicated, but wherever there's a complicated problem, there's a solution. Again, if you measure the eardrum of these crickets across a range of frequencies, you can see that there's a lot of vibration in this particular range of frequencies, which is the frequency of the song, but only at low call intensity, meaning if it's far away, it's tuned in better than if it's close by. And again, this is at the ear itself. Okay? And remarkably, this, I hope you can see this next slide, this tuning actually shifts with temperature in the same animal. Okay? So the ear is tuned to one frequency at one temperature, and you warm up the animal and the tuning shifts, more or less in register with the way the song shifts. And I'm emphasizing again, this is at the eardrum itself. Okay. I'm going to end with talking a little bit about mating behavior. So in these animals, so the male calls and the female uh, approaches the male and she mates with him. And he, here, what the male does is transfer this little bag of sperm. He actually hooks it to the, to the genital plate of the female. And then the sperm have to make their way into the body okay, of the female. And to keep the female from kicking off this bag of sperm, the male produces some attractive secretion, which he feeds on. So it's in his interest to keep her there feeding as long as possible so the sperm get transferred inside. When you look at the mating behavior, what you find is that female tree crickets actually mate longer with larger males. Don't worry about this graph. So they spend a lot more time mounted on larger males than on smaller males. And of course, when males are calling, females will preferentially approach louder males. And this is a direct consequence of their localization algorithm. Remember, they will move towards what is louder. So if you are a male calling here and there's another male calling here, then whoever is louder at where the female is is where she's going to go. And if you are lou much louder at source, you have a huge advantage. Tree crickets are probably the only group who actually build a device to make themselves sound louder. They actually build a sound amplifier. And they do that by cutting a little hole in the leaf and singing through this. This can make the sound three to four times as loud. So you can imagine how much of an advantage they would get. The bigger the leaf, the larger the leaf, the larger the gain in amplitude. And if you do an experiment where you give males leaves of different sizes, small, medium, large, very large, the probability that they will actually produce this amplifier is much higher on large leaves than on small leaves, because large leaves give them much more amplification. And in fact, they actually optimize this. So if you give them a choice between a small leaf and a large leaf, everybody, all the black dots are animals, everybody will choose the larger leaf, and they 
make these little baffles at positions that optimize the gain and amplitude that they actually get from it. So I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to stop there. Um, and I hope I've made a case using these many different examples that many of the problems that vertebrates solve using brain or neural computational power, insects solve using small, smart structures and smart mechanics, okay? Mechanics that we are barely beginning to understand, but which in their own way are probably as complex as the computational processing that happens in animals with big brains. So if there's one thing I want you to go back with uh, in this talk, it is that smart doesn't necessarily mean big brains, okay? There are different ways of being smart. Um, I just want to quickly acknowledge all the wonderful people that have had the privilege to work with over the years, a number of my students, uh, in particular Natasha Matre, who did a very large part of all the sound localization work, and uh, Monisha uh, Swati, who did a lot of work in the Kudremuk animals, and Kaveri, who did the ear tuning work, um, the main people who did a lot of this work. So I will stop. I think I've taken slightly longer. One minute longer. Than that. Yeah. We can take a couple of quick questions. But I can answer you at the end of the session. In case I, yeah. Ma'am, you mainly spoke about the mating calls and everything. Yeah. So the insects that have that live in communities. Yeah. And they have alarm calls. Yeah. So will each individual have a have the same alarm call to communicate with the community or is it different for everyone? I don't know the answer for insects because it's really much less studied, okay? Uh, but certainly in vertebrates, yes, there are signatures of who's making which alarm call. Thank you. My question is, um, do we find such kind of very simple answers to solving complex problems in other uh, kinds of signals, not only in auditory, uh, in case of insects or in other animals as well? I'm sure. Yeah, certainly in the visual system where structure, structure so, is deployed to, to solve problems, certainly. So what other kinds of uh, uh, communications are there that have these kind of solutions? necessarily communication. I mean, it's also true, for example, in navigation, huh? in insect navigation, where a lot of the solutions lie in the geometry of the eye. And uh, another question is, uh, if you, is it compensated for the distance? I mean, uh, the nearest male one will, would be having a louder yes. call than the... Yes, that's an excellent question. Um, the problem with all of these algorithms that use intensity is that whatever is louder as at where you are is what will dictate how you move. And so basically the whole thing becomes very stochastic, right? Because it, it, it's a question of where you are with respect to everything else at that moment in time. And as you move, that whole thing changes, okay? And that's the reason why you have to take it into account. And in our simulations, that's what we take into account. So you move and then the whole world changes, right? Let's thank Professor Rohini for the wonderful talk.